What's up, everybody? It's Brandman Sean, and this video is brought to you by BrandmanNetwork.com because I signed myself. Now, I have a very special guest for you guys today. He is a rapper, and this rapper actually also works at Facebook. So trust me, he has some interesting things to say just in general. But in this interview, man, um, I had the, the, the pleasure of meeting him at, at a Trapital brunch over A3C weekend, and just so many interesting conversations at that table. And he was just one of the amazing people that had some really thought, uh, cool thoughts and insights that I think will be interesting for you guys to hear from an artist perspective, from somebody who might be working a regular job perspective and look, everything in between. So let's get into it, man. Ace, what is up? I'm That's happy good. to hear. Appreciate yeah, you. Vice versa, man. I appreciate you having me on. This is exciting. For sure, for sure, man. Um, like I, I guess you gotta, you know, you gotta start here, right? Mm -hmm. How long have you been rapping? So many people are always wondering, like, how long has someone been rapping? Word. Uh, I, you could say that I've been rapping ever since I was three years old. Uh, I come three? from a family. Yeah, I come from a uh, family okay. of like, you know what I mean? Like, we was we we thought we was gonna be like the Jackson Five growing up. My mom had us <laughs> doing boys to men dances and singing Whitney Houston notes and all that. So you know, between my mom, my sister, my little brother, we was always writing and you know creating poems and our own songs, um, or all that kind of stuff. So I've always been in Dang. that. Shout out okay. to Dr. Seuss teaching me my first rhymes. <laughs> we just been going from there. I would say like officially as an, as an artist. So I've had two stints, right? I had the, I'm 15 years old. I think I'm gonna do this as like my full time, but didn't really have, it, it was just the skill. It wasn't necessarily the mindset. Uh, and then, you know, now as Call Me Ace, I've been that since 2016, just like going in right after graduating business school. Um, and just been focusing on it from a completely different perspective than when I was a, a high school kid from Bridgeport, Connecticut. <laughs> Got you. <laughs> All right, so tell me, what's the biggest difference? You talked about skill set versus mentality. What was sure. the biggest difference and shift that you felt like you had to make when it became, yo, I want to pursue this as a career? Yeah, definitely. I would say the three biggest differences for sure, um, you know, uh, again, just the mentality. I, I have a a music business mindset as opposed to I'm just going to be creating music, throwing stuff out there and, you know, seeing what's uh, I like it. That, I like that's it. definitely been number one. Number two, I would say just personally. So uh, whether it's just, you know, my faith, growing in my faith in Jesus, uh, getting married, um, you know, Big having steps. a full-time job. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like seeing, you know, me and my wife combined have seen, uh, over 50 countries and 100 international cities, being able to speak multiple languages. Whereas when I was 15, I was just a little kid from Jeez. the hood, right? That <laughs> that's number two, and then number three, my rap name, man. <laughs> I had a completely different rap name back then. We won't even talk oh, about. Oh man, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I was about to say, you know, I was going to ask. <laughs> my first, my first rap name uh, was Young Ace, but okay. then. It became something else, <laughs> and now it's called me. Is it's almost like a full circle. You you went off path. You had some years. Yeah, I, listen, I went way off path. <laughs> Prodigal son had to come yeah, back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Shout outs to Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> all, right. Right, all right. So tell me this then, man. Um, like, what sh when you say like music business mindset? I thought that was interesting that you noted that. What did yeah. that look like to you? And well, actually, more specifically, what did you observe in the game where you felt like, you know, this artist is failing, right? Or or this artist or these artists aren't being successful because of that. And I'm not trying to go that path. Yeah, 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 yeah. I would say so, you know. All right. Quick te technical difficulty, but yeah, what, what what were the things that you analyzed? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, just going to, taking a step back. So I went to Columbia University, uh, got my bachelor's there. Uh, while I went there in New York, first of all, I went to school because there wasn't really 
th like that's just what I was told to do. Um, I was the first one to uh, my older sister and and me, first ones to go to college, first generation college students, first generation Jamaican Americans. I went to school, didn't really know what I was going to do. I thought I was going to do economics because you know be a business person, whatever. Got a straight D in economics, so I was like, all right, not gonna go that route. I'm gonna go <laughs> complete social sciences. So ended up in anthropology, which was dope because I got to write my entire way uh, through those classes. But while you I was how out you travel so much? Huh? No, I actually didn't do a lot of travel. I mean, I went to, I mean, I went back home in Jamaica, and then I also went to Spain, but not not like crazy traveling. But that's where I actually um, I created the Columbia University Society of Hip Hop, aka Kush because uh, that's just who we was. Um, and, you know, in that process of, you know, just growing my craft and performing for my, my uh, classmates, et cetera, um, growing our, our, our fan base, if you will, uh, we had the opportunity to open up for Snoop Dogg while he came out at Columbia. And around that time is when I was like, I'm gonna stop rapping. I don't wanna rap anymore. I don't like what I'm rapping about. I don't like the path that this is going, et cetera, et cetera. So I stopped rapping for like four years and I went to business school with a mindset of like, yo, I'm just living a completely different life. I'm about to just get a job, get married, do the whatever is normal thing. Uh, and I went to go study abroad in Barcelona. As I'm studying abroad, I, I'm, you know, exploring all this is where I start traveling. I, you know, I'm out in Geneva, I'm out in, you know, Italy, I'm, I'm speaking Spanish in Madrid, all these different things. I come back home. My old homie from, from way back when, longtime friend is like, yo, do you know how to rap anymore? I'm like, yeah, I guess, but like, that's not my, that's not my focus. You know what I mean? I got one more semester before I graduate business school. I went to uh, UC Berkeley Haas um, out in uh, California, which I think is still the top 10 uh, business school program in the country, which is dope. Hey. Shout out to Haas, go Haas. Um, but, you know, I'm like, nah, that's, that's not even in my purview, even though I know how to do it. And he's basically just convincing me Cause I'm telling them, yo, I'm about to get married. I'm about to have a full-time job. I'm about to have a healthcare plan. I'm about to make like real money. <laughs> like I didn't have money in college. Like I was eating ramen noodles and wonton soup in college, you know, like I, <laughs> money wasn't doing that or, you know, music wasn't doing anything for me. Right. Yeah. Um, and it was just like, yo, everything sounds the same. But as I was telling him all these different things, he was like, yo, those are all the more reasons to rap because you would actually then bring a unique voice and you'd be something different. You'd be able to stand out differently. You would actually be more relatable to kind of like the common people that aren't, you know, just out there trying to chase a dream because sure. people chase dreams in different ways. So I was like, I right. found whatever. And so as I'm finishing my last semester of business school, for me, I started thinking about, okay, well, if this is a product, right? If music is a product, if me as a brand is a product, then how do I create this? You know, how do I put this together? What does it mean to be a musician in 2016 when I'm out here in the Bay Area and, you know, it's, it's not like I'm at UCLA, I'm not at USC. And so I started right. thinking about this from the mindset of entrepreneurship, just like my friends that are, you know, learning how to pitch to VCs and create a product and all these different things. I'm like, okay, well then let me think about it from that mindset. So that's when I started reading up on a lot of these books and getting into those resources to think about it from the perspective of a business. I already knew I could rap. That was like a non-issue. I wasn't trying to what, learn how to make that. It was like, yo, how do I like- What books did you read? Oh man, I got, I got a bookshelf right here. Let me see if my poor little eyes can. What's actually dope is that I've had these books for quite some time. I just never really understood them as a kid. And now I actually mm -hmm. understand them, but it's like, yeah. uh, how to be your own booking agent, um, Guerrilla Marketing 101, the truth about the, the music business, Music Business 101, this like really large anthology about like music law, uh, concert and promotion, the artist management, these are like billboard books, let me see, Hip Hop Wars, you know what I mean? Um, uh, how to be your own booking agent. What do you think about that book? I haven't read that book. Man, I, I love that book. That actually, it, the reason why I've been able to like book my own shows and get to the point where like I'm headlining my own shows is largely because of that book. It, it mm. you know, at the end of the day, and, and you, this is something that I definitely took away from a lot of the books that I read is that all of this is doable if you just put in the work. Um, and, and be and, willing to- And be willing you know, to put in the work. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> to do it. You don't need to have like the shiny stuff. Most people don't want to see what reality is because yeah. there's a lot of artists that are, making 
this image and doing all these things to to fluff it and then you're trying to chase what these other people are doing and you can't figure out how you mm. get there so you start to cheat the game not realizing you're actually doing what they did because they were cheating the game in the first place and it becomes this cycle Sean, you just say, yes give me some no, hard numbers every everything you just said is exactly what i've been fighting against for the past few years because mm that mentality of like, let me try to be like them and da 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 I know if I have to cheat my way, I'm gonna cheat my way. That was, that was the younger me. That was the pre-business school me. That was, you know, whatever. And, you know, given, you know, those things that I talked about that's like got me to where I am, it's like, look, yo, like I'm doing this because I desire to. I'm doing this because I have the desire to create a business. But like, I could also stop doing this and from a financial perspective, be very fine, right? So like, I'm not doing this to, look like I have something that I don't. Mm. I'm doing this because, you know, I believe I have a, a, a viable product that I've been able to prove year after year after year, people want this. And I've been growing it in my own way. And sure, it takes time, but I'm willing to understand how to run this business in a way where eventually it will scale. And that, you know, that curve, we, those that understand like a scaling curve, it's like, all right, there yeah. will be a point where like it will become unmanageable I'm kind of, yeah. you know, I'm kind of like at the cusp, but right now it's like, okay, what is manageable for me to do? And understanding right. those behind the scene things actually makes what you see on the surface a lot more palatable, you know? Mm. So I, I totally yeah. hear you. It's like, you know, when you learn that, and I, I'm thankful that I, you know, I took marketing classes, I took operations, like I, I work in marketing operations, I do strategy, I used to be a consultant at a top four uh, consulting firm, like I've worked with Fortune 500 companies, all of that stuff. So I see how they run business. Mm -hmm. So why do I think that just because I have a talent, you know, I should just <laughs> put chase clout and like hope like there will be some type of infrastructure? That's not how it works. People hide the fact that it's supposed to be or get confused that it's all just business because of this whole mystique of creativity that we create. But yeah. it's like, no, nah, man, like, yeah structure has to be there you have to be a, to create something sustainable it has 100%. to be structured i don't care how creative the thing is you have to do great business to even create space for creativity mm. right like so that's a bar so, yeah for real man like it's, it's interesting bar. i was just uh watching this other byron Alla interview because i watched his breakfast club interview i don't know if you've yeah. seen it but you yeah need, i saw okay. that i saw that amazing bro yeah, amazing. <laughs> so then I watched this other interview and he said, talked about building his company and going through all these processes and switching from being talent to business person, but or just looking at the game differently. And he said, um, he so the first show he did was called Real People, right? Okay. And apparently, this is like the very first reality show, yeah. right? But except it wasn't, you know, obviously it wasn't with all the BS to today, right? It was a different yeah. perspective, yeah. But he as obviously like 1970s, maybe 80s or whatever, being black, he was being paid less than his co-workers, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think he said first year he made like 1K while his co-workers were making like 7K or something like that. Okay. And every year he got a raise, but like on the fourth year, he basically demanded for that year, his fourth year, to at least make what everybody else made the, the their very first year, right? Wow. It was and that they, much of a disparity. That much of a disparity. And they told him, nah, you're not worth it, right? Mm -hmm. And what he said was, um, because his mom was his manager as well. So one, he said he'll never be in a position where someone would tell him or his mom how much he's worth and he's not worth, hmm. right? Hmm. And, um, and that's when he said he flipped it from being show business to business show because he said that's what the actual business really is it really is that business first and then yeah. show he's like all this creativity and things like that yeah that's 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 great you want that but usually to start the business and get things popping and yeah. to even be around long enough for things to pop you got to have business 100%. in the first place right 100%. so I thought that was interesting and it was what made me um and I just saw that so it's like fresh in my mind. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, thank you for <laughs> that. Yeah, nah, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get that link from you later. I definitely want to double tap <laughs> into that as well. That's I mean, that's it. I I it really hit me and it and it hit me it hit me a lot harder once I started to get my hands dirty and really mm. experience it. 
right? Okay. So being in 2016, not really understanding. I mean, at that time, I was just recording like one-off tracks, just like getting the groove back, right? Like greasing up the wheels. I ended up meeting Shanti, who produced, um, uh, he's a, you know, Bay Area super producer out here. He's done a lot of stuff with like Mr. Fab and uh, Feeling Myself by Mac Dre and things like that. And so- Got you. I was like, thinking like the uh, Shanti from the workout videos. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no. Nah. Nah, 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 all good. <laughs> Um, and so when I connected with him, he was like, yo, he really encouraged me to like put together like our first project that we did together. So that in 2016, that was my first man, dude, I was, I was at consulting, doing a merger and acquisition, uh, case working hundred hour weeks and I'm dropping this project and like literally leaving at 5 PM on a Friday to set up for my release party. At, at the door and, and getting, you know, my wife and, and my homies are at the door, like man in the booth and collecting tickets, selling pieces, all this stuff. And I have to like transform from like consultant back where like no one knew I was a rapper to like, mm. now I have to be a rapper and like literally being on the ground and be like, okay, this is my first experience, right? Show, it went well. Like I thought only 30 people was gonna show up, over a hundred people showed up, cool. What worked, what didn't work, post-mortem. I, you know, connected with my wife, what well, we're well, all right, now let's, let's double up. Let's figure out how to do this better. Right. And that's literally how it's been. Like no one, I'm just now at this point where it's like, yo, I need a team. Like other people around me are saying you need a team from people that I meet, you know, in the industry outside of it. It's just like, because you, I'm one of those people where it's like, I'll learn how to do it myself. Like I, I have a recording studio. Like I said, mm -hmm. I've been making music for a while. So I'll record myself. I do my own artwork. I'll figure out, you know, how to use Adobe Suite, et cetera, et cetera. But there's only so there's only so long that you can wear all the hats as you continue to grow. Yep. And yep. now I'm like really at that point. I, I remember you and I were talking about that, right? Like it, there comes a point where you have to scale and the way to scale usually is, um, you know, doubling up the, 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 the human resources. Um, that's really where it, right? And so like building those partnerships with the right people where it's like, hey, I need help with, you know, uh, reaching out to uh, media channels. I need help with um, reaching out to these venue, uh, these talent buyers and these venues and coordinating with their schedules four months out while I'm simultaneously working with the producer. And it's like, mm. I can't produce all my own stuff. And we're like all these different things, but yeah. you know, you, you appreciate it more. I feel like there's no, it's not easy. You know, don't, nah. And I, you know, I work in social media, like don't, don't buy your, your followers. Cause then your engagement rate is going to be trash. Like 0.001%. Like it's better to have a thousand followers and have a crazy engagement rate, you know, working for 200, 300 likes than to get that same amount. But you got, you know, hundreds of thousands yeah. of followers. It don't look good. Yeah, man. Most of that is ego, man. At the end of the day, that lack yeah. of pay, like lack of patience and ego, those are the things that lead to people cheating the game in those particular ways. But the yeah. weird thing is, you know, of course you can't lie to yourself. So it just is what it is. You'll know. <laughs> Young Jeezy. Yeah. Young yeah. Jeezy got that line in Trapper Dye's life. <laughs> How the grown man got to tell a lie to himself to turn around and tell the same lies to his fans. <laughs> Disney World rappers in fantasy land. Yo, shout out to Young Jeezy. Clearly. <laughs> He's <laughs> made an impact. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I tell people Young Jeezy influenced me. <laughs> they, don't, they don't understand. They don't, they, they don't see it. <laughs> they don't see it. They don't get. They be like, "Man, That's you funny. grew up on a on like Talib," and I'm like, "Yo, I appreciate what that means, and I I respect Talib like entirely." But like, uh, I actually like growing up. Like I said, yo, like I was a little kid from the hood, man. Just hey. doing, <laughs> doing things. Things change, you know what I mean? God, you so can't merciful. judge. God, so now, Check this out, though, because I, like everything I'm hearing, all the work you've done, obviously, just because of what you've done and in terms of even consulting and things like that, you have work ethic built in, mm -hmm. right? Because you're used to working more than a lot of people can. There's a lot of people who s say they're hustling and all that stuff, and they've never hit a 100-hour week, right? They, mm -hmm. They've never even hit a a 40 hour a week, some of these people, right? Cause they're cheating so much on a regular job. It just is what it is, right? <laughs> so like, I think it's interesting because where that's led you and so many people who get to this point is they actually get pushed into needing to build infrastructure to scale the team and all that stuff where there's a lot of people 
who are looking for that stuff too early. So mm -hmm. yeah. again, before we get off this subject, I want to hear you just say a few specific things for you um, that made you realize you need a team, just like two things. Yeah. Um, when I, so I have, I have a to-do list and it's pretty long and this is just one of them. <laughs> and I wake up in the morning in the midst, of, in the midst of my job, simultaneously crossing off stuff off this to-do list on an hourly basis and I'll go to sleep. And my desire is for this to-do list to be shorter. Then it makes me feel happier. It makes me feel like I've done something. Yeah. I've been going to sleep now, and the to-do list is longer than when I started. Every time, yeah. Every time. Hey, tell me about you know, it. Tell the me work, about the, it. The, you know, my work is, is, is growing. You know, I'm, I'm doing well at my job. Shout out to that. Not worried about, you know, anything, right? Because I'm ensuring that my stakeholders there are satisfied with the work that I'm doing there. And simultaneously, I'm ensuring that my stakeholders in the music era, like my, my, my fan base, my supporters, et cetera, are also being satisfied. Um, yeah. that, that comes with a lot of different things. And so the fact that I can no longer just go to sleep at 2 a.m. and be like, wow, I've done a lot. Instead, I'm going to sleep at 2 a.m. Like, oh my God, there's still so much to do. <laughs> and I got to wake up early and then go back to work. That's number one. Um, mm. Number two, uh, you know, so my last my last project airplane mode that hit the billboard chart hit the itunes chart and Dope. um i'm i'm thankful i'm thankful for you know my supporters that really enabled that to happen uh because obviously i can't do that myself it's not like i'm buying a thousand copies to make that happen so uh <laughs> <laughs> though though some do <laughs> that's that's neither here nor there um but um to do that again and again to say okay i want to i have a fan base growing in let's say atlanta okay getting a show in atlanta and actually like building that uh presence while also doing the same thing in dallas while also doing the same thing in this growing base in toronto while also oh hey there's people hitting me up in tokyo japan saying that they you know love my music um to say, okay, I've done, I know how to set up a show in the Bay Area, now let's just do that in all these different places. That's an, enti that's an entire job. That, like, that's literally an entire job. Yeah. Simultaneously, you know, that's gonna need media around that, right? If I, if I show up in a spot, I would love for local media in Atlanta to know that this guy who's performing in Atlanta, you know, this is who he is. But to do that in all, that's another literal job. It's like to, yeah. to, to, to do these things, it was dope in the context of like Bay Area. <laughs> it was dope in the context of like, you know, gotcha. leveraging like who I know in the areas and environments that I'm in, but like, I can't be everywhere at the same time. Um, and, you know, on top of that, like more people are coming in, right? You have to respond to more people. You have to, uh, right. you know, all those different things. Like these are all literal jobs, like to do marketing is a literal job. And so while I know how to do all the different jobs, to do them all successfully and the way that they need to, to, to be done um, at scale, it's just not, it's not feasible. Not in the current situation that I have where I'm like, I literally have two jobs. I literally have two jobs. Yeah. Hey man, I, I get it. I mean, and that's a real part of the process, having to give that stuff up, wean yourself off some of, of that crack of, I, I do it all myself. You know what it I mean? Is, it is crack. <laughs> it is crack. You know, um, but it, <laughs> because short term is more self gratifying, but it's detrimental long term once you hit yeah. a certain threshold. And totally. you actually have to become comfortable not being the best, yeah. right, on your team in that area, which is a weird thing when you're someone who has done a lot of things and even have the capacity to be really, really great at it. However, you're saying, I'm going to be great at this. And that's a discipline, right? Because this is my role. I'm going to be a monster in this spot. So I need to find somebody who has the capacity to be great in that spot and let them surpass me. So I don't have to focus on that at all. Because if I get somebody who's not as good as me, right? Right now, I'm just looking over my shoulder, trying to correct them. And now they're a headache. You get what I mean? Yeah, yeah 100%. <laughs> 100%. Delegation is very, very tough. Um, especially when you don't trust the people that you work with, 
And there I've, you know, I, I know of cases where I work with people and they don't deliver anywhere close to like satisfactory. Um, and then the question is like, do I, you know, I've, I've, I've had an example where like, you know, I'm working with a videographer, person falls through. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to put together my own music video. Like I've had mm -hmm. to do that. I've had to be like, Hey, I'm going to, you know, this person offers to help with reaching out to media, you know, does a subpar job. I'm like, whatever, I'll do it myself. And, you know, triple up, quadruple up over whatever they were able to do, right? Like I've been in those situations, but I've also been in situations where like hand something off to somebody and then they kill it. They like create something that I would have never even thought to do because they, they are a hundred percent focused. They're determined, they're willing. And that so, stuff is beautiful. right. And so you can't, you can't let the, it's like basketball. You know what I mean? Like if you're going to be a ball hog because you don't trust your teammates, I mean, at the end of the day, you're just going to exhaust yourself out. Right. Yep. Uh, you have to let your other team try. Uh, of course, there's like a whole pre-team process of like choosing your teammates. So you would hope that the people that you've cho chosen, you've vetted them out already. But then after you've vetted them out, like let them shoot the ball. If they miss, they miss. Once they make <laughs> it, you celebrate them making it, right? You, yeah. If you are in a coach position, you help them get better and you just play the game. Like you're, mm. I, it's not like I make every shot that I take. So True. I should treat that same level of mercy and grace with my team members getting there instead of being like, oh, I'm going to do it. Because at the end of the day, especially if you're in a, a growing business, like if your business is really growing, um, then sure, like celebrate the work that you've done. But now that means that your responsibility is not just to grow it by yourself, but to bring other people with you that also believe in your mission, that believe in you because you've invested in yourself. And to go back to what you were saying earlier, like, don't, don't ask for people to invest in you too early. Like if you haven't even shown that you can invest in yourself and make something happen. Like it's yeah. a lot, like you can't blame people for being like, Hey, that looks dope. I want to be a part of it. It's not necessarily just because they want the shiny object. Although a lot of people do, but it's more like, Hey, I see Sean's commitment in what he's done, what he's built for himself. I want to be a part of that. I want to see how I can enable that to grow even further by leveraging whatever skills and experiences that I have and bring that to the table. Like people get attracted to want to hire or sorry to interview for a company because they've seen what other people have done for that company already. And so you mm -hmm. have to be that person and invite that. Like it should be a blessing and be like, Hey, I need more people. Oh, but I've like proven something is dope enough that other people actually want to come. So that's that's where I'm at, where it's like, okay, let me like talk to these people and I'm like getting the team together right now. It's gonna be gotcha. cool. 2020 is gonna be fun. <laughs> hey man, look, I'm, I'm, I'm all there. I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you right now, man. Um, <laughs> but it takes patience, right? Um, yeah. Now, how'd you get on the billboard charts? Talk oh, me man. through that, pro what was the name of the project? Yeah. What was your planning like for the release, right? How yeah. did you even, build your fan base like i'm asking all the questions this is really the preview right stay tuned because he's going to talk about how did he build his fan base what project it was what the rollout looked like right <laughs> <laughs> but we, but, yeah yeah but we can bring it back to initially how did you build your fan base yeah uh my fan base so when i dropped this project it was in march 2019 and mm -hmm. like i said i started getting back into music in 2016 so the fan base that i had was a three-year fan base uh mm -hmm. it didn't didn't happen overnight and one Important. can argue that i'm still growing i thoroughly believe that i'm still growing um i love everybody that supports me um and i believe that you know i've been building those relationships nurturing those relationships since i started um and so to even be in a position where i can say hey, you know, let me at least shoot for it. Didn't know if I was going to make it, but <laughs> let me shoot the shot. Um, but then reach out to my fan base to say, hey, this is what I'm shooting for. This is my goal. If you can help, et cetera, et cetera. And then they did it. I mean, glory to God, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful. But that, so my fan base, you know, as far as how it's been growing, um, you know, just constant, constant one-on-one -on -one engagement. I, I would say that's been my strongest asset for sure is um, not just relying on a social media post 
to make you feel like you are actually engaging with your fans or that your fans are engaging. So is this in the, like the DMs? This is like DMs, messenger, phone numbers, in-person meetups, emails. Like for me, what I did was I started with family and friends, like immediate friends first. So when I started, uh, it was at UC Berkeley. Um, and so, you know, not every, not everybody that is your friend or your family member is going to like you as a rapper and you should accept that. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> you should accept that's just life. It, it's okay. Don't, 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 you know, cut them off and be like, Oh, you're not family anymore. That's, that's just going to happen. Uh, but you start there, you figure out like who is going to like you <laughs> as a friend and as a rapper. Uh, and then some might actually like you more as a rapper than a friend, go figure. Uh, but you know, you start there and then, and then you bridge out. Right. So like yeah. you drop something and you ask them to share it, you know, you, they, it's just a slow build, right. Slow growth. Um, by the time airplane mode was set to drop, it got, I, I was aware that it wasn't just my friends of friends that, that knew who I was. It was like friends of friends of friends to the point where like, I didn't really have a connection necessarily with every single person that was aware of me that liked me that considered themselves a fan at the very beginning it was like oh i know by hand who's my <laughs> fan right. right um anyway so getting up to when i decide so around this time last year my aunt um unfortunately passed away um and i just got into a moment of disbelief, um, a need to, to cope and figure out how to basically go on with uh, the days because yeah. I didn't want to do anything <laughs> anymore. Yeah. Sorry um, I, I, no, I appreciate it. Um, a couple months before that, uh, my mentor had actually timely told me to not just rap about the stuff that's good and positive, you know, rap about any, like anything real, um, just to continue to grow within my like authentic uh, brand. And so as just a way to cope, I was like, okay, well, let me write about these thoughts that are currently in my mind. The first song that I wrote was Hope You Hear Me, uh, which was the within the hour that my aunt passed away. And it was really just me talking to and reflecting on the life of my aunt. Um, within those next two weeks, I was just writing nonstop. Um, the producer that I worked with, J Dot, he had a bunch of beats that he was sending me. Again, just like coincidentally, that just ended up being the fuel that I needed to keep writing and keep writing. And then I ran out of beats and I was like, send me more. He sent me more. I kept writing. And then I was like, send me more to the point where he's like, I don't have any more. But like, I have to make new beats right now. I don't have any more. Um, but that was just my way of coping. And so by the end of October, early November, it was like, okay, well, you know. I have these songs, what should I do with them? And I, uh, so I, I read uh, articles from DIY Musician, the, the CD Baby blog, um, pretty regularly. Again, going back to just constantly learning and staying abreast on, you know, music tactics, marketing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, read about, uh, I believe it was uh, Ty, Ty, Ty K and Shannon Curtis, um, how they've hit the Billboard chart. And I was reading, you know, what did they do to do it? Um, how did they think about it? And I remember with Shannon, it was something like it, it only took her 250 album sales to hit, like hit some part of Nielsen charts or something mm -hmm. like that. And then for, okay. for Ty, he set out to do a thousand or I don't, I don't remember if he said, I can't remember ex the exact number that he set out for, but um, you know, the results for him, how he hit the billboard chart. I was like, oh, well, if that's what they did that, if that's what they did in order to do that, uh, me analyzing my fan base and analyzing what I was going to go for, I was like, I think I could do that. Uh, at least let me try. Um, and so, you know, convince my engineer, convince my producer, convince my wife, uh, let's try it. And um, that's what even like put into my mind that it could be a thing. By that point, it was November-ish, mid-November, uh, and I set it for March. So I had about three, I, I had this project for like three months, uh, and I decided to drop, the reason why I chose March was because uh, 
my mom's birthday is on March 21st. And so when it dropped, it would be on my mom's birthday um, as a way to, you know, symbolically be like for her, for my aunt, et cetera. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so the first song that I dropped from the project was 515. And that's also when I started the um, pre-order campaign. And just even taking an additional step back, like how was I going to hit the billboard chart? Really the, the thing that I learned from those two articles, as well as just understanding how billboard works is that if you basically your first week sales is your first week sales, plus everything that you've sold before the day of your release. And so the more that you've sold before the album drops, the more that gets added onto your first week sales. Right. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, if I have two months <laughs> to, to, you know, get where I need to go and, and, and not only uh, communicate this to my fan base, but also see if I can meet other people and build new fans and also tell them about what it is that I'm doing, which I, I did, right? Like I was going to Berkeley, I was talking to people in Portland and, you know, I'm connecting with people that I know and I'm like, Hey, you know, ask your friends, like convince them, et cetera. And there were some folks, man, like really out there, like recruiting their friends and being like, Hey, you know, my homie, like this dope artist, my brother, et cetera. Like, you know, I remember my sister, she was like every single day, like on social media at her job, you know, mm. on the subway, like just really pitching being like, Hey, help support this independent artist because his message is dope. Da, 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 da. Um, I will say that I think what helped for me, um, you know, one, the fact that the fan base already existed Two, um, right. I thoroughly believe in the product that I put out, like, you know, if you hear the lyrics, you, you definitely feel like you know who I am. Uh, and I really try to bring that level of, of authenticity and just the, the, the experiences and perspective that I have into my music in a way where folks can really resonate with that. You know, I've had people, even before Airplane Mode, I've had people say, wow, your music really helps me, you know, get through my day. I've shared this with my uh, cousin who's contemplating suicide, like all these different things. So I was already like invested in the, the, the music and the product itself. And I, I'm very much like, yo, once you hear the product, like you'll like it. You know what I mean? Just like taste and see right, that right. it's good and then the rest will follow. So already you were having- invested and they were invested. Exactly, right? And so it wasn't like I was trying to, you know, sell chicken nuggets and call it gourmet food. So I feel like the product really has to like stand on itself regardless. Yeah. Um, and yeah, in addition to, I mean, like, I did do advertising, but not, not crazy. I mean, something like this, to ask people in 2019 to spend money on an album, it's not for the casual like observer. Like, so these were hard album sales? These, I didn't even, I didn't even, I didn't like even CDs print out a, nah, or like streams. Dig, nah, like digital. Well, so, I mean, digital CDs is like the, the hardest of CDs in the US <laughs> these days. That's, yeah. just, that was hard. There, there are some people that probably would, they probably thought they considered themselves my like fan. Maybe they still do, who knows? I'm not gonna judge them. But they were like, no, I don't, I don't wanna buy the CD. And for me, I was like, you know, it's less about the, the CD, right? Because you could still, you know, stream it, Apple Music, whatever, whatever. It was about the goal and, and what the goal entailed. And for, you know, my, my fans, my supporters, they understood that. And they were like, yeah, I'm willing to help you hit this goal. I, I, I want this artist to hit this goal, not right. I'm buying this so that I can listen to the music. And mm -hmm. I think when it comes to somebody that's like either a casual listener or like doesn't know you at all, like if you're a stranger and I'm like, yo, you know, the guy on Times Square, like trying to front off the CD, like, no, no one wants that. And like, if right, anything, right. they'll just stream it when it comes out. Um, right. So just even you gave thinking, people something to activate around and exactly. to rally around. Exactly. Another thing that uh, really helped. So that's why advertising, even though I did it, it did not help to sell the albums. It just helped create an awareness. Um, if anything, uh, especially due to the targeting, it was really just for my fans that already are aware of me so that they can, and, and, and then they're, you know, just their circles, just to keep them in that mindset that like, this is something that's taking place. These advertising, these advertisements wasn't for, um, 
like creating new fans to buy my album. Like that just doesn't even make sense. Like if it was an awareness campaign, it would be more like, you know, my music video dropped. Like yeah, just yeah, yeah. listen to that, right? Just be aware because people are gonna stream whatever. And then if they're really curious, then they'll see like, oh, there's a campaign going on. And mm. I would share on a daily basis, you know, hey, Sean, thank you for buying my, you know, pre-ordering my album, you know, and I'd call you out and every single time, right? And just create that proof that, yo, like people are actually out here doing this. If you've been following and you haven't done it yet, why haven't you done it yet? Um, right. And so that definitely happened. Uh, that definitely helps. Uh, and then another really big thing that helped, two more things. One was uh, just like the, 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 the refollowings, repostings. My mind's everywhere, yo. It's, after work <laughs> but um, uh i had a i had a, a pre-release uh album pre-album Watch, release like party. the pre-save yeah yeah, yeah yeah pre uh, pre-album release uh party oh party. and okay. Got in it. order to enter you can either buy a ticket or you could pre-order the album um mm -hmm. and so there were some folks there were actually some folks that i met um that were my fans that i've never met before um and came to the party pre-ordered in order to get to the party and and you know introduced themselves to me and was like yo like i i love your music i'm so happy for you da 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 da, da. that like blew my mind but there you know there were examples of those and then also like you know my fans and supporters coming through and then bringing their friends and their fans or and, and their fam uh to to do the same thing and and i made it so that pre-ordering the album was cheaper than buying the ticket so it was kind of it was just additional incentive you know to be like yeah but i i want to see what this is about right yeah um, you gotta make things make sense so we'll yeah question. so just to be clear right so is this off of itunes that they're purchasing so i had three places where folks can purchase uh Bandcamp, okay. uh itunes okay. and um and my website and if you ordered it from my website, you could also do a bundle of like getting a shirt as well. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, I want to, I want to touch base on that. You're, you're bringing up a, a dope point. So I want to come back to that. The last thing I want to say, so there were three things. It was, um, you know, creating the proof of concept and the one-on-one -on -one engagement with my fans. It was the pre-album release party. And then it was also uh, casual Fridays. So I've been doing episodic content basically around the same time that I was like, yo, I'm going to be creating a new album at mm -hmm. the time they weren't connected. It was just another way for me to like do something in the state of mourning. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, um, <laughs> you know, casual Fridays, uh, uh, a, a concept that one of my homies was basically just like, yo, you know how to freestyle, like content is King, get in front of a camera every single week and just freestyle. And so I've been collecting words from my fan base on Instagram with uh basically just content to freestyle at the end of every single friday been doing it for 48 episodes i got through four more to go because i'm trying to just get to 52 do it for a straight year and just have that be a story but anyway as i was doing that around episode six or seven is when i started doing you know my airplane mode uh campaigning and so then it became you know this is something that people are watching every week let me wear my airplane mode t-shirt let me mention how far along we are in our progress to potentially hitting the billboards. And then it just became another vehicle, my own media, to be able to communicate what it is that I actually want to happen. And for you know people that would just kind of stroll onto Casual Fridays, it was just another way to create awareness in a way where I didn't have to pay for it. Um, mm. So those three things really did help. To get to your point about like how to get the album, I honestly don't even know if I could do this twice just because <laughs> the like iTunes is phasing out. Right? right. And at the time it, they, they never said they were going to do it, but at the time it was kind of like common sense. It was like, yo, you're making it so much harder for people to pre-order an album. Like if you, <laughs> yeah. I had the iTunes pre-order link, but if you clicked it, it would immediately bring you on your desktop. It would immediately bring you to Apple music. And you had to like scroll down to the bottom of the page, like below the fold, look for a uh you know see also in itunes click that and then you'll see the pre-order option Jeez. no one in their casual right mind is going to do that and even like the most devoted fans struggled with that and then on mm. your phone it was even worse you click it you click the link it, it immediately brings you to the apple music app as opposed to the itunes app so that created some friction um in general just the fact that i had three different links for folks to choose from i created a super link but 
at best, it took like seven clicks for people to get to that point of purchase. And so, you know, you want somebody to depart from their money in a quick way <laughs> and, you, and you got them like doing seven loops. Yeah. And so yeah. it's just like, like, you know, glory to God, I'm thankful that I got, you know, you know, whatever milestone that we, we ended up getting, but it's like, that was hard. That was not, that was not easy in any way, shape or form. It probably would have just been easier to sell physical copies, but uh, there's a rule about like, you can't sell the physical product until the physical product is actually out. And I just did not have the wherewithal to think about how to make that happen. <laughs> I just said, I was like, nah, yo, like, and nah, nah. And it's just like, it's already hard. Like, yes, CDs can be souvenirs. I would have actually preferred to have like a vinyl. I feel like vinyls are more of a, or like cassettes or like more of a souvenir right. than a CD. Yeah. CDs still kind CDs of a little, yeah, well, CDs are a little bit too current. It's too current. <laughs> like it's current enough to be like, I'm never going to use this. I'm not, I'm not even going to like yeah. put it up on a wall. Where it's like yeah, a final, it, like, oh my gosh, years. like, yeah, I won't even take the plastic <laughs> off. Like, it's different. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, yeah. you know, hopefully I like answered, you know, a bit of just like the, the thought process and um, the way I went about it. Yeah, I think there's a lot of things for people to pull from from that. Where did you chart on the uh, Billboard, by the way? The, the Billboard Hip Hop R&B Album Sales Chart, number 50. Oh, dope. I think it's like 50 out of 50. <laughs> I mean, that's, the, 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 hey man but that's cool that i mean there's that there's when you recognize there's a system right the system has rules and you just have to play that game if you want to hit those particular things right yeah. and just like how you talked about when you decided to take music seriously and you looked at it as a business because the business has games let me go learn the build the rules of that business all of these are systems that have their own games and if you have to win it one then you have to play by those rules in yeah. some form of fashion right and i think yeah. a lot of times people's confusion where it looks like somebody went off path and didn't do the norm but they were still successful and they're still making money and doing their thing in music is all about yo they they really broke the rules and they were still successful mm -hmm. but those rules that they broke really aren't the rules of the game there's that perceived game that people like the popular you gotta do yeah. this stuff you gotta hit these charts or you gotta play you know be standing next to these people be at these award shows that yeah. isn't the actual money game the business game has completely different rules that people usually just don't talk about right so you can be yeah. winning at that and you can seem like you're doing something offbeat but you're playing by economics the economics says how many fans do i have how many tickets can i sell how many yeah. people can i mobilize the Absolutely. other stuff, right, is like, how many followers do I have, whether they're real or not, because people can't tell, right? How many, <laughs> like, you know, all these things that, that could be gamified and not really yeah. give a, a true sense of the 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 true one-to-one -one value, right? It, totally. The, what's, what's the word that I'm looking for? I don't know, but like, you know, when it, once things get online, right, it, it's scary because it can, it can, it can skew. It can, it becomes far more abstract versus real value to to towards what is actually worth and what you actually think you're seeing because 100%. just like when someone is making a comment, right? The the, the webs the web is an equalizer. So yep. if you see these comments and the things that make people mad, if you actually knew who were making the comments, we have this natural ability in the real world to create credibility and to truly measure and judge. If, if, if you're talking shit to me and you're a 14 year old kid, then I'm like, all right, bro. You know what I mean? Like you're 14, talk all your shit, right? Yeah. But when it's online and you don't know this person is 14, this person is <laughs> 20, this is an old lady, right? This person is very successful at what they do. This person is just angry and sad. And you, know, you don't know any of that stuff. Right, it's just equalized. It's all the same, and we and we lose that judgment. It affects us different, and I think artists or just people in general that are trying to build something, right? Um, they that is what skews the data between what's real. So all that just just to go back to, I appreciate the fact that you can like deduce all, from all that BS, like and see what the actual system is, and know that you're actively playing that game at the yeah. time 
and being yeah. and being cool with it. It's like, oh, this is what I want to do. Now, now I'm going to do this. It might yeah. not affect this, but I know that it's not going to affect this. I'm doing this because I'm trying to get to this goal, right? And now I want to do this. Now I'm going to go play that other game. And obviously, as you get your team, right, you'll be able to play all the games at once at, at some point, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. is the goal. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> then, then we can have fun because trust me, there's like a jillion ideas and 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 hypotheses that I've yet to, you know, experiment on. But that's, you know, you really leaned into one of the points that I also wanted to share with your community, which is just don't, don't, don't be afraid to experiment, yo. Don't be afraid to just try new things. Like, if anything, like I try my best not to listen to what people tell me to do. Like the 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 common norm. I'm like, let me figure it out. Like I'm a hard headed learner. My wife will tell you. Like I'd rather walk into the fire and be like, wow, that's hot than yeah. not walk into the fire because someone told me not to. You know, if anything, like, you know, I wouldn't be doing I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if 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 I was listening to other people. Like other people tell me, like, yo, there's there's only plan A. You 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 don't need a job, like jump off the deep end and and eat ramen. Like, fam, I got a I got a I got a whole human being to support. <laughs> you know, like and I've been I've been homeless before. Like that's not cute. And I actually don't think that you have to be a starving artist in order to be successful. I think it's wise to, uh, you know, have money in order to make, it takes money to make money. There's always a startup cost before you get to any type of revenue. And, and this is a business, this business costs money. Like, you know, companies spend money to market and promote a product that they know works not that they think works that they know works so if you believe that you have a product that works but you have no money to even get it out the door you don't got no money for like mixing and mastering and 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 like copyright costs like i don't understand i mean that then you put yourself in a situation i mean frankly right like i don't i'm not like trying to seek for a deal to like pay my bills da, 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 da. and I understand how people can get in that predicament where like when you're starving, you know, a cracker looks amazing, you know? <laughs> and it's like, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a starving artist. I, I want to be a successful artist and understanding what that means. And success for me is honestly being able to do what I love to do and, and not have to worry about, you know, the means to do it. Um, mm. And for me, money is not the end. It's, it's a means to, and I want, I want the business to be sustainable so that way, you know, I can do all the other different things that I'd want to do in that, right? And so, like, I'm making money from it now. It's not paying all my bills. Um, but right now, I've been setting the foundation to be like, okay, well, if I want to scale and get to that point where things are actually, now I understand how to do that. And so, to your earlier point, it's like, all the experimenting, you know, again, what it's been three years <laughs> it's been three, three years, years man. and that's, and that's, that's and this beautiful. is just this is me toying around like how can i how can i uh get a a, a blue check on instagram without you know faking forty five thousand dollars you know what i mean like you know how many people like just hit me up to be like did i buy it like no i didn't buy three years of blood sweat and tears that's that's not <laughs> that's not what i did <laughs> i yeah. didn't buy like oh is it because you know you have this job or that job no it's because I'm, I'm literally doing the work. Like if you, if you can prove that, like, I mean, honestly, all the stuff, like after hitting the billboards, right? Like then that, that's when the press comes in, like reaching out to people and people want to talk, but then also like, I'm just being a real human being with them. And so I'm talking to folks and they, they actually appreciate the story that I have to share. And I appreciate them for taking the time to listen to my stories. Um, you know, I'm, I'm doing Instagram ads, and then a DJ sees my ad and is like, yo, I love the content that you have. I love the message that you have. I love the quality of the video. I want you to come to Portland and be on my uh, podcast and I want you to perform at my show. And now mm. me and DJ Cliff are like real cool homies. I've been, a, every time I've been to Portland, it's because of him and, and that community out there and been growing out there. Like all this is organic. All this growth is literally just, just, just putting myself out there and doing the work. And so there's, I, there's no short, if you want the ownership, there's no shortcuts. If you are just trying you to, you know, ownership. be, you know, be on everything. I have no interest. I've, I'm so used to being the brochure kid growing up. You know what I mean? On the, on the <laughs> smile, say cheese, pull me out of class. so I could take this picture. Like, I don't care. Like being on the cover of a magazine don't make you money. And so I'm less concerned about just being everywhere. I'm more concerned about just having a, a dope, sustainable business with real social impact that people like and want to share. 
and that's what's been happening. And so I just want to take it to the next level. Love it, bro. Love it, man. Um, and just that one thing where you talked about <laughs> when your broke a cracker looks good. That actually <laughs> no offense. <laughs> no, that was, I, been, <laughs> I, know, I know, I know, I know it very not, well. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Oh, man. Listen, October 28th, every single year, that's Zambu. Listen, that's Zambuki Day. Okay, let me tell you about Zambuki. Zambuki, okay. me and my homegirl, we, uh, 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 we was making, we were so broke <laughs> at Columbia University of all places, right? Ivy League school, can't afford lunch. We would make these, these amal like amalgamations of sorts, like pasta with hot dog and beans or you know, uh, we would we would uh, we would put cheese on the bread and put it in the microwave. We thought we was making grilled cheese. We was making melted cheese sandwiches. Look at that and salt like, bread. The salt bread. <laughs> 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 it sort of throws some hot sauce before you put, you gotta put the hot sauce in before you put it in the microwave. You know. Oh man. And uh, we just one day we was like, yo, we gotta call these zambukis. We gotta give these names so that when we like, yo, we want a zambuki, we know what we're talking about. And so literally from this, this shout out to my home girl, Kimmy, AKA Cadence. But um, we've been like every single year, I, I had a note of that, like in 2012, like Facebook reminds me every single year, like, you know, Zambukis or whatever. And so it, it's just a reminder for me to be like, yo, like I, I know where I come from, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm the allure, like I'm not trying to hit the lottery with my life. Like there's a way mm -hmm. to build, I mean, you look at, you know, Nipsey, you look at E-40, you look at Master P, you look at these folks that have built their own businesses. I mean, like, shout outs to the model of entrepreneurship and independent. And I live in the Bay, like entrepreneurship is literally all I'm surrounded by. Everywhere. Right. And yeah. so, you know, I got to have that same mindset too. And I believe I can. And therefore I'm doing. Dope. Love that, man. Look, and we're going to end that here. Make sure you tell everybody where to follow you. It's going to be on the screen, but I, I, I yeah, want you to yeah. have a drop. Yeah, not nah, bet. Uh, call me Ace. You can find me uh, uh IG. Call me Ace Legit because uh, I'm way too legit. <laughs> I'm trying, <laughs> trying to be like you because I sound myself because I'm way too legit. Uh, Twitter, same thing. <laughs> Facebook, same thing. YouTube, just type in call me Ace. It's three words, yo. It's like a Tribe Called Quest. It's like verbatim. Wow. Uh, and yeah, that's that's about it. <laughs> Dope, man. I appreciate you. Once again, everybody, of course, this video is brought to you by brandmannetwork.com. If you like this video, go ahead to the like button. If you like it, you might as well share it. And if you're not subscribed, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button.